fun and introduction to Mountain Yard, Mountain Yard culture. And we're going to be explaining all about um, who we are and what the culture is in just a second. First, if you need a little help, oh, if you need a little help pronouncing the term, it is right there. Um, if you want to sound it out, it is a French word and it's Montagnard. So that last part is a little difficult. It's Nyard. <laughs> okay. And here's a little information about us. Okay, so this past summer, all three of us had the opportunity to go to Vietnam and do some exploring with our cultural heritage. I'm Lee and I identify as Kohol, one of the Montagnard groups in Vietnam. And just a fun fact about me, I love music. So in my free time, I like singing and playing piano. Um, we're gonna introduce you to some music from Montagnard culture. It's gonna be a little different from what you're used to, but it's gonna be fun. So we're excited to share with you. Hey everybody, my name is Abigail. Um, and the H in the front of my name is silent, but I also go by Abby. Um, my mother is Jirai and my father is Abe, and those are two different um, cultural ethnic groups, but we speak very similar languages. And a fun fact about me is I love to read, and one of my favorite series is the Harry Potter series. And just as a little fun fact, the Harry Potter series has been translated in over 60 languages. This means that it's been read all over the world, and even in Vietnam, which is the country that we're going to be focusing in on today. Hey everyone, my name is Foon. It sounds like Spoon. Um, and yeah, I'm so excited to share with y'all about the Montreal people. Um, I identify as Benong and I was born in Vietnam um, and my family came here in 2002. And I guess like a fun fact about me would be like, I love bananas, I eat like two a day. Um, and this was a really great thing in Vietnam because the produce was very affordable and there are so many different types of bananas. And we'll talk a little bit about more about fruit. So yeah. Oh, I think that's how they have it so that they've got oh, this. Oh, so that I can see what it is. Okay, gotcha. Okay, so these are our learning objectives. And essentially today, the students are going to learn about who the Montagnards are, where in the world we live, and learn about our cultures. And this includes music, weaving tools, and food. But first, we're going to start off with a little activity. Yes, so we're going into a little game and just like to get y'all introduced to our different languages. Um, so we're going to talk about fruit. We love fruit. Fruit is so awesome and there's so many different varieties of fruit in um, Vietnam. So I guess we can start off with Lee and how she says fruit in Kahal, which is the language that um, her and her family speaks. So in Kahal, to say fruit, we say bly, so bl and then I, like eyes on your face. Um, and typically we will put that in front of like the fruit we're talking about. So we can say like um, when we're referring to like orange, oranges. So, yeah. Yeah, and Ade and Jirai, like I said, are very similar. So we both use the word ba, and it also literally translates to ball. <laughs> Same here. And ko, blai also means ball as well. Mm -hmm. um, and so banong, you also say blai. Um, you can say it with more of a P sound or more of a B sound, depending on your dialect. So uh, my family, we say blai, but other families from different um, regions or different areas in Vietnam who are Banong might say Blai, um, but they mean the exact same thing. And it's the same as Kaha because Kaha and Banong actually come from one language family called the, the Mon Khmer language family. Um, mm -hmm. And just as Lee said, we put this before we talk, before we say like the name of the fruit. For a lot of them. Yeah, for every a, single one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for a lot of them. Mm -hmm. um, so we're going to go into like a little kind of interactive game, hopefully. Hopefully this works. So we're going to show you a fruit and then you can type in your responses. We'll give you like 10, 15 to 30 seconds to type in a response and then we'll reveal the fruit and then we'll talk about the fruit and then we will each um, go in and say how we say that the name of the fruit in our respective languages. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. Okay. Let's get started. All right. So what is this? Yes. Okay. okay. All right. You guys are so smart. These are bananas, but these don't really look like the bananas that we eat here because they're green. But a lot of produce in Vietnam is actually very green. And this doesn't necessarily mean that they're not ripe. It's just the way 
the fruits there are. Um, and so let's talk about how we say bananas in each of our languages. Okay, so in Kohol, we say brit for bananas. So you might have to, I don't know if you can roll your R's, but yes, it's like brit. <laughs> so brit, it's very quick. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in a day in a dry, it's um, pretty different. We say mthay. And the M is very subtle, so you would say mthay as opposed to mthay. So mthay. And in Badong, we also say brit. Yeah. Where these are awesome. Bananas are awesome. We had so many bananas um, yes. in Vietnam, and they're not very common here, but in Vietnam, in Southeast Asia, they have little, like, uh, they call them apple bananas, and they're so tiny, and they're, like, a little tougher, but they're so sweet and so good. Yeah, some people even have banana trees, like, growing right outside mm -hmm. of their backyard. It's just really nice to look at. It's so different from here, where you don't yeah. really see where your food comes from. So, yeah. Yeah, that picture is actually from um, my aunt's garden. So... There are bananas everywhere. Awesome. All right. So this is the next fruit. What do y'all think it is? That's one of my favorite fruits, by the way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I feel that. We got mango, mango. Okay. Yeah. Awesome, y'all. Y'all are so smart. These are mangoes. <laughs> Very cool. Awesome. Okay. So in Kohol, we say fly, like. Like we said, fruit, right? Fly for all. So fly for all. Mm -hmm. For all. It's broken. Mm -hmm. um, and a day we say bo swai, which is um, actually kind of similar to Vietnamese, which is the national language of Vietnam. Um, there is bo again, which means fruit in general, and then a swai. So bo swai. Um, and jirai is a little bit different, and it's similar to the last part of the kaha word. Um, so it's bo o. Um, it's a little tricky because it's very similar sounding, but it's bah ah. And in Banang, we say kind of a combination of kahana day, bai swai. Um, mm -hmm. And we took, yeah, so I think swai is a Vietnamese word and we've yes. incorporated it into our language. Um, so yeah, and in Vietnam, there are also so many varieties of mangoes. The ones that we showed you in the picture are like super, super sweet, very delicious just to eat by itself. But they're, mm -hmm. um, and these are like golden and yellow and they're just so tasty, but they're also like, lighter ones that are smaller and also tougher and you eat those usually um with like salt and oh, like chili peppers and it's the best yeah, snack ever yeah. for so you kind of like sour and spicy combination yeah. um, it's really good yeah it's different varieties with just yes. one single fruit all right this one might be a little tricky um some of you may not know some of you may so let's just like see what y'all think Dragon fruit. Oh, oh. Okay. I see, I see. <laughs> Has anybody actually eaten this fruit? I'm just curious. What does it look like on the inside, do you think? Yes, they said they've eaten it. Was it good? <laughs> 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 I don't like it. No. Oh, wow. You just see, haven't had the right kind. Yeah, the thing is, um, yeah. here in America, what I found is that it's not as sweet as it is in Vietnam. Yeah, um, this and is because true. this is this was naturally grown in my um, grandmother's garden and when you open it up it's black it's white and has black seeds on the inside and it's just a lot more flavorful there than it is here mm -hmm. um it's very like light yeah um, it's I, a very yeah, yeah light very taste um, and i think there's a blue yeah there's a blue variety like yeah it's pretty good to me mm -hmm. um the trees are beautiful in my opinion um they grow they look like cactus. I believe they're in the cacti family. Mm -hmm. um, so they grow and they're like long and green and spiky. Yeah. So. It's also one of the most import or exported fruits um, from Vietnam, which means that it's one of the most popular fruits that are shipped out of Vietnam to other countries like the United States. So if you've had dragon fruit, it might have come straight out of Vietnam. And you'll probably find it in the markets. Like there are plenty of foods that you can find out in the markets if you walk out. It's a good time. Mm -hmm. So for Kohol, we draw from Vietnamese. So it would be Blai and then Tang Long, if I'm not mistaken. Because mm -hmm. I'm not, I don't speak Vietnamese, but we kind of take it and put it into our phonetic. And what I remember is Blai Tang Long. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Yeah, and a day and a dry are very similar, but there's like a slight difference. Um, a day is Bah Gu Ga. And Jirai is Wahgunga. So it's like a very slight and subtle difference there. And then in Banang, it's very similar to Kahal. It's called 
Blight Thai Long, and it's also derives from Vietnamese. I asked my mom about this one, and she was like, I don't know what that is in the Nong, um, but I think she referenced like the Vietnamese um, translation. Yeah, we borrow sometimes. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, awesome. All right, the next one also might be a little tricky, but you guys have been surprising me, so yeah, I'm sure you'll probably get it. Oh, yeah. So, this little story when we would visit people, they would just offer these fruits like so casually, but here it's so expensive. Mm -hmm. So it's one of the things I personally miss mm -hmm. eating, and it's like really sweet and juicy. Um, let us know if you've had it and if you liked it. I love it. <laughs> Someone says, can't remember the name, but love it. Oh. I love it too. I ate a bunch of it this summer when I was in um, Indonesia, oh, Singapore. Yes, yes. I think it's actually from, originally from Indonesian because rambut in Indonesia means hair. So what's the name? <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, so we call this fruit rambutan in English. Um, and I also, I was just talking to Liz, but she went into Indonesia and ate some rambutan. And in Indonesian, rambut means hair. Um, so some people also refer to it as like the hairy fruit because it looks like little hairs on the fruit. Yeah. It's not the cutest, but it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty cute. Yeah, it's so cute. It was yeah. a little scary. Yeah. It was a little scary, scary. but so delicious. Yeah. So, it just so good. feels... Yeah, you have to peel it, it feels off. feels great, honestly. And there's like yeah. a seed inside, yeah. so you just kind of eat around that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It was pretty good. I remember just like finishing meals and then there would just be like piles of dessert. rambutan yeah. um, yeah. just all over the place. It's awesome. So let's talk about how we say rambutan. Okay, so this one's fun um fly fly jum jum so fly jum jum okay and day dry is boss up boss up um and then in banong we say fly trang fly trang okay so that's the end of our activity um we hope that y'all like that and learned a little bit about fruits in vietnam and now we're gonna go into who are the montagnards okay so the term montagnards that is coming from the French who colonized Vietnam. Um, but this is a term that we use in America to refer to these groups of people. And there are over 50 ethnic groups and we are only representing four. Um, so we don't know every single thing, but we do share some similar cultures, which we're gonna share with you today. And um, we just wanna make it clear that we're not the ethnic Vietnamese that everybody assumes we are, so we are, separate from them. We speak different languages and um, we have different history, but we are also connected through a certain history as well. Um, and the six biggest groups are Jirai Ede, which Abby identifies as, Benhar, and Kahol, me, and then Benong, and then Sting. I don't personally know anybody from that ethnic group, but those are the six major groups. Mm -hmm. And just another interesting fact, like, a lot of Machina people can speak Vietnamese because that is the official language. So like when you go, when you have to go to school, communicate in public, you have to know the official language. So they tend to be bilingual if they know two languages at least, if not more. So that's just an interesting fact. Yeah. So where on earth can you find us? Um, first of all, the largest group of Montagnards live in the central highlands of Vietnam. Um, so if you look at this map over here, um, this is the country of Vietnam, and it is divided into different regions, and the Central Highlands is just one of the regions in the south. And conveniently, this map is also um, divided by ethnic groups, so you can find exactly where a majority of the groups can be found in the country. Um, however, many Montagnards have immigrated since the Vietnam War ended in 1975, and this means that they have moved out of Vietnam to live in another country. So where did they move to? So the second largest group have lived throughout North Carolina, the state that we're in right now, since the 1970s. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of us can be found in Greensboro, North Carolina, Charlotte, Raleigh, and New Bern. Um, so if you're in any of these places right now, you might know some Montagnards, um, and you might even live next to some. So the culture is there, and if you look around, you might find it. Um, and we met in Greensboro. So yeah, all of us. we're all from Greens Guilford County Schools. You know where you are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, representing. Um, there are also small communities in other countries near Vietnam, like Cambodia and Thailand. And this region that you see here, where Vietnam is, and there's Laos and Cambodia and Thailand, 
Um, that's what we refer to as Southeast Asia. Um, so it's like right underneath of China. Um, and we also, there are also communities in Europe uh, in countries like France and Sweden. So we're kind of all over the map, but the most of us live in Vietnam and in North Carolina. Yeah, in communities outside of the main Southeast Asian region, um, we call them being a part of the diaspora. So that's just a new word if you're not aware. Yeah. So um, we're going to go into music and I'm going to show y'all a song and a dance. This is going to be a Kahal folk song. Um, um, let's see. Okay, then you try this. But I can give a background yeah. on the song. So the song is typically sung for children and it's just singing. She's singing, this is um, one of our friend's grandmother and she shared with us um, a song that talks about different animals and what they eat. So you'll have like a local bird eating certain berries um, and a certain animal eating the chili peppers and a certain animal eating the rice. Um, so it's, it's a fun song, but I think the video is not. Yeah, yeah, if you want, we can log out of my Gmail okay. and log okay. into yours. So stop if you guys share. want to talk about something else for a minute, you can, we'll stop share. We'll come back to these videos okay. in one okay. second. Yeah, so, um, yeah. Um, Yes. So with a lot of folk songs, um, they're typically sung and shared orally, which means through mouth to mouth as opposed to written down. Okay. Um, yeah, so our traditions are based more so around talking and singing, not necessarily through writing. And a lot of people tend to have a hard time trying to find history with that, I guess, because it's hard to find documents especially with our group of people. Um, and we've been separated because of um, immigration. So it was great being able to come back. Well, not, well, me, I was born here. So her and her, <laughs> they've been able to go back. Um, and we've been able to do this product, project and actually be part of continuing that tradition of oral um, history because we documented these things by interviewing and talking. Um, so that was just an extension of one of the things that we've always been doing. Um, and what do we want to say about dance? So uh, for um, dance, people typically wear um, traditional outfits, which we have on today. And if the video works, you'll definitely see um, the traditional outfits. And typically women wear a top and a skirt. And the men usually wear, what is it? They cover, they wear, they wear a top similar to this. Um, okay, so I think the video should be working now. <laughs> this is on a little play. <laughs> okay, um, just to go into dance. Um, unfortunately, we can't look at that right now but a lot of the dances tend to have repetitive movements. So when they move their wrist or they move their fingers or their ankles and their feet, then it tends to like repeat. And so they'll do the same thing over and over again. Um, and the songs can be um, slow and calm or they can be fast and upbeat. And typically there are a lot of group dances too. Mm. All right. Sorry about that. Okay. We'll, we'll come back to it. We'll power here. through. Yeah, we'll just keep going. going okay. <laughs> so luckily there are some pictures here that you'll be able to able to see, but a lot of instruments um, in Montagnard, cult, Montagnard culture tend to be handmade. Um, so in this video, you will see a gong and a drung, um, which um, it would be better if you saw it than if I described it. Um, but the, you hear the instrument that you see here is known as a ding nam, and it's actually made out of a gourd. And um, 
And then, yeah. <laughs> I did add some new videos though. Oh, so you want to do those first? So we do, I do have a version where the videos will play, but if you guys want to do what you have here and then yes. you can come back, I can open up and we will yes. be able to watch those okay. videos. Um, and if you could help me fluent with the pronunciation yes. of this instrument. Um, so this gentleman here, his name, I call him Jeb Wu, um, and he's really awesome. He actually, a really fun story, or a really cool story is, um, he used to tame elephants, and he tamed, like, two beautiful elephants, um, but unfortunately he sold them, but, like, they were, like, his prized possessions, um, and the flute that he's playing is called a Nahum, um, it's actually more like a recorder, I guess, and sometimes there are certain songs that you can use to, like, tame animals or tame elephants specifically um yeah and he's like a legend in my <laughs> town um in uh, vietnam which is a uh, duck mill so yeah yeah and um something about music specifically with these instruments is a lot of them aren't practiced as widely as they used to which means they're not um today they're not as played as they used to be and that a lot of that is because a lot of people are moving more towards like instruments like pianos and guitars that you would see here in America. Um, and they're not as readily available and they're not made as often as they used to be, but they are really important. And the fact that they're made usually from people's hands are a really significant part of all, our culture. And also just want to add that you will find these performances more so on the tourist side of things. So yeah, you'll have to pay for them um, for the most part. Um, but in terms of like the traditional practice, a lot of times when you have groups that have been Christianized, they tend to not really practice those things anymore um, because the music is connected to um, rituals too. Okay, so, all right, video is not working, but we're still gonna talk about this. Another part of our cultures, like all of our groups, um, a lot of us, well, not a lot of us, all of us weave. So we have lots of different items that are woven. So this here is a rice pouch. And in Cajol, in, there's a general term called polo. And there's not supposed to be an I, so it's just P-O-L-O. -O. Sorry for that mistake. So polo is how you say it. And there are two different types. So this can be taken to work. So you just have rice in here and you take it to work. So it's like a lunch bag. And this is called the na because it's small. And then the bigger, the bigger version is no. So this is a type of below. And we can open it up for you. And this is typically woven by women. And it has very intricate designs. Let us know what you think about it. <laughs> <laughs> I remember like seeing it and thinking, wow, I wish I had one of these because it's very convenient because a lot of people when they work, they go, they work outside. So of course you're going to need food. It gets very hot sometimes and you're going to get really, really tired um, and hungry. Um, and another thing that we like to weave is baskets. And now this is something that men typically do. And in Kahol, you call the baskets soap, and there are different types. There are some for working, some for decorating. A lot of times when we would walk into um, our family's homes, we would see a lot of these soap with like embellishments, so they would have like fringes on them, and they're just really pretty. And um, they would be at, like the in the living room area to decorate. And then one said that they want one of them. Oh. <laughs> oh. Take it. <laughs> um, They're hard to find they here. Are. Yeah, I, I haven't seen one of these. Mm -hmm. um, I never saw them until we went to Vietnam. Right, and but like, if you go to Vietnam, there will be stores that sell traditional items, and they are typically made by Montreal people and sold through like Vietnamese markets. Um, so if you go to Vietnam, you can find them there. We don't personally have any connections to anybody <laughs> in North Carolina. Not, not yet. yet. Not, not yet. yet. If y'all do, <laughs> maybe one of y'all do. There's so many of you out there. Right. But there are plenty of people that, well, not plenty, but there are people we know that do weave these things, these outfits. Um, just want to show you. Some people have taken the route of just sewing, but people still weave um, traditionally with a loom, I believe. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times it's like this setup of bamboo, right? 
Yeah, it's different kinds of like they look like sticks. Yeah, bikes. and you it's basically really intricate. It's a big process. I don't know how to personally do it, but it requires um you sitting down and stretching your legs so that you can hold out one end of it with your leg, and then the other end is obviously controlled by the other part of your body. Um, and it yeah. takes a lot of time. So if you're really skilled, it'll take probably um a couple of days yeah a few days week, it's a, and it's not something you do it's like something you kind of do for maybe an hour you take a yeah. break yeah you do it the next day when we were visiting my aunts um in vietnam a lot of them had loons and would maybe cook the rice or prepare the meal um and as like the meal was like simmering or whatever they would take out their loom and um finish up like whatever section they wanted to but it is a process and there was also a really young girl that was in my mm -hmm. village her name was not and she was so talented she i wish i had the bag with her but she wove really really beautiful bags that people would take with them to church um and she was maybe only like 10 years old so this tradition is still like passed on um but really like you have to find the kids that are like willing to do it and want to do it but yeah it's very One beautiful person asked if you talk a little bit louder. yes okay. <laughs> yes we can okay yeah also <laughs> girls typically learn this skill around 11 or 12 so they learn really young um and I forgot to mention that weaving, we call that in tang. And then when you're talking about a, a blanket or a skirt, you say oi, so tang oi. And then if you're talking about a shirt, a top, you say tang ao, so weaving a shirt. Um, and ao is taken from Vietnamese. So you see the borrowing again because we live together, so that's going to happen. You're going to see a lot of language borrowing. Yeah, we can show other um, woven items. So right here, this is a bracelet that she would wrap around your wrist. And so it's kind of like a friendship bracelet, mm -hmm. if you have ever made that, like at a summer camp. And they vary in color and in design and shape. Um, we have this wallet as well. And um, yeah, these are all, like we said, handmade. Um, they make the textiles and they add all of this stuff, like the, the Velcro. It's very modernized. Yeah. Yeah, so you have items that are influenced by the traditional um, practices that have been modernized, which is fine. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's fine. It's similar to this. Like, Mostly. this is pretty modern. Um, Do you want to wear it? Yeah, I can. She can demonstrate. Demonstrate in case you don't know how to put a purse on your body. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, cool. You know, put everything in there. You know? <laughs> Go shopping. Okay. I'm also wearing, um, yeah, let's look. <laughs> I'm also wearing a hand woven outfit. Um, oh, yes. Yeah, you're gonna model it. Oh, yeah, this is, yeah. This is scary. They're typically very long, so they cover, they go like down to your ankles for the most part. We don't typically wear anything short, but we have seen people who have had it cut to probably above their knees, mm -hmm. but nothing too short. Um, <laughs> yeah, and they, yeah, so there's like different, as you can see, um, patterns here, different colors. It's different than hers, yeah. uh, like mine is vertical. Hers is horizontal. Yeah. Um, they vary and widely. Just um, also, we don't wear this like every day. People in Vietnam don't wear these outfits every day. They typically wear these for special occasions. So maybe wedding. wedding, naming ceremony. If some people, some people still do some of the traditional practices, even if they are Christian, some people still like, mix them together mm -hmm. so it just depends on the community and how much modernization they've gone through uh, how much interaction they've had with Vietnamese people just a lot of different factors okay so next one. Oh well there's pictures <laughs> these are pictures now that's the, the same thing we talked about earlier below and it's it's very very intricate the designs and these are the baskets and the baskets shown here this one you can see the little black dots those are decorations so you'll typically see those um in the home for decoration and these are more so for work and what's interesting is the older they are the darker they'll get because and i know traditionally they'll put them above a fire to dry because when people take them out to work it might get wet and then this this is a basket for fishing so they put it in the water and it's also used for like carrying vegetables and that's the material for weaving these 
and it takes a lot of like skill to be able to mm -hmm. carve it and then make sure it's tight enough and there are different patterns for the different pieces or the different parts of the the basket so the body the base and the rim and then you also have to consider have to think about the strap the straps mm -hmm. yeah yeah so you wear them these baskets the taller ones you wear them on your back um if you're using it for work yeah and men to men are the ones who um who do these tasks so yeah and these are just more examples of our textiles and this is from a alcohol shop in Langbiang. So that's near Da Lat, and this is the south of Vietnam. Um, mm -hmm. And like we said earlier, this is oi. You can use this also for, what is it, wrapping a child so you can carry them on your back or you can move them to the front. If you get tired, put them on the side. That's also a big part of um, the culture. You'll still see people doing that today. And that's um, a picture of a woman who works at the shop who she's demonstrating her weaving um, a skirt and you can see the setup all these sticks and then you can't see her legs but that end right there is where her legs are yeah. moving on yes so moving on we do so these baskets also become tools that people use for daily life um, and so we have many handmade tools and most of them like I said are for daily life and because a lot of um, daily life revolves around agriculture and going to the farm. Um, these tools are very helpful. I can't show you the video now, but I will show you, we can show you them later. Um, and so this gentleman over here, this is like a photo of a gentleman who's showing us how he actually makes this fishing basket. And as you can see, it's like kind of conical or conical, and then it uh, like uh, comes to a end a stop at the, the bottom. Um, Yes, it comes to a close at the bottom. And so we use this typically for fishing. And in Benang, we say bam. Um, we call this bam. And so it's really beautiful. And then the uh, two ladies over here are just like holding some other different tools. So the one with the green arrow, we call tung kumpe. And it's basically like a tray almost. And women usually, typically, after they've harvested the rice grains and let it dried, um, they will put it, the rice grains on the tray and separate the outside covering from the grain itself and it's like very difficult actually it's like fun to watch Looking the woman it. yeah you're like watching you have to shake it uh -huh. it's a technique it's really fun to watch but like actually doing it yourself is so difficult um i tried to do it but the it rice was... just like fell on the ground like it was really horrible um but it's okay we learn we'll learn um and then the big basket over here is like similar to what we just showed you before and this is this is how you would typically wear it and we call that Tung sa, um, and usually women would um, like if you're trying to harvest some vegetables in your garden or what it have you, you would bring your basket and then you'd like go down and pluck the leaves and then put them in your basket and move along. Um, and it's really wonderful because um, like the women there are so resilient. They would have the basket on the back and then the baby in the front, and so they're just like picking out the leaves in the garden and then like put in the back while they're like cradling this baby. Um, mm -hmm. So very useful tools um, and. Yeah, that's and how people live. They still are very connected to agriculture. So, yeah. Speaking of agriculture. Yeah, so we're gonna get into like food. And uh, first thing I want to talk about is farming. So, like we said earlier, farming is like a really big lifestyle over there. Many Montyard people do have coffee farms predominantly, but some people also have like like soybean farms and like corn farms. But predominantly, coffee farm is all over um, the Mountain Yard like all over the lands, like the Montreal landscape. Um, and a lot of people depend on this for like food on the table and the coffee will be sold into markets. Um, and so I think in all of the places that we went to during our summer abroad, um, each of our families had coffee farms. Um, and then to kind of complement, supplement that there, we also have like home gardens that are outside of the home. And so for like, if for example, my aunt would have like a little garden in the back of the house and in the mornings, she would just like pick whatever vegetables that she wanted to cook for the day um, and then go out into the coffee farm for in the afternoon and work and then come back. And again, she would go back to the farm and pick whatever vegetables that she wanted to. There are also markets nearby, but it's just like the convenience of having your food right outside um, is really valuable. Um, and so I do have some videos, but they're not going to play. But um, the woman in the left 
she is harvesting or no she's weeding her uh farm right here and this is my aunt and she has a green bean farm or it's either green bean or soybeans um and she's just weeding them and it's a very like labor intensive job and it's very arduous um but they're very resilient people um and then this is an example of a coffee farm over here i believe and just a fun fact vietnam is the second largest exporter of coffee so it's very big. And you'll also see a very big cafe culture. Yeah. So there are plenty mm -hmm. of ca cafes, and you'll also have lots of access to Wi-Fi. It's free. So if you ever consider going to Vietnam, And you have look. to try Cafe Viet. Yeah. So in Vietnam, a lot of people take their coffee with, like, it's just, like, espresso, basically. Um, and they have, like, this metal tool that they use. Mm -hmm. um, and they would put, like, ground beans in there and then have the water filter through. And then you get condensed milk. Mm -hmm. And then you just put condensed, like, like, double the condensed milk and like it's like a two one to two ratio of like coffee to mm -hmm. milk and so it's super super sweet but it's like very intense bitter. it's very bitter it's very sweet and very bitter at the same time yeah it's very strong so it might not be for everybody and it's if you order it you just say caf cafe soda mm -hmm. cafe soda mm -hmm. so it means milk in vietnamese mm -hmm. so so yeah. it's literally just coffee and like condensed milk yeah it's really really great um, moving on to food, meal times are super important. Um, in Vietnam, probably the first question that we get asked, like coming through the door, is like, "Have you already eaten?" We went to a lot of different houses and visited a lot of different people, and we people would always be so adamant about like making sure we had eaten and like feeding us. Um, the hospitality there is just next level, so you will definitely be gaining some weight, but you'll, it's good. It's great food. Um, yeah. And a lot of the time, meals are shared, and like it's very important that everyone sits at the table together and shares a meal together. Um, and rice is a must; it's a staple. And there are even three different words in Banang for rice, like the rice that's growing and like in the field, and then the rice that's harvested, and then finally the rice that's cooked. And so, I can eat that up to you actually. So we call the rice in the fields ba, and then pe is what you call the rice that's harvested and then biang is what you call cook rice um and so meals would usually be like rice in the center and then you'd have like a meat dish and then like smaller like vegetable dishes um and yeah i don't really know what else to say but yeah meals are really important i don't know do you guys want to talk about what are your favorite foods that you had over there i love pork <laughs> so i know it's very fatty i like pork skin and then like i also love spicy food so we have a staple item um, fish sauce, it's very strong, so it does stink, but it's very tasty. It's salty. Mm -hmm. You mix it with um, chili peppers. You got a nice combination of peppers and salt, and you just, you can dip anything in that, literally, and then we'll have a mixture of vegetables. It's just, you mix, and you just eat what you want to eat, basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, meals tend to be, like, rice, a meat, and a vegetable, so the meat can be, like, pork, fish, yeah. beef, chicken, mm -hmm. and the vegetable can be, like, cucumber, squash, um eggplant yeah whatever it's in season yeah. what's really funny so in vietnam or in my where I, my family lives my family is really big on this one um like vegetable called pep te, and my aunt dried so many she wanted my mom to have some pep te to give to my mom so my aunt dried like a whole bunch of them and she gave it to me and like my suitcase was just i just had a full suitcase with only pep te. and after <laughs> vietnam we went to indonesia and we went to Bali, and in Bali, people, there's this really big law in Indonesia, like, you cannot bring any kind of um, narcotics into the island. And so they they asked me to open up my suitcase, and I just had all of these big bags of leaves, and the Indonesian police were so confused about what it was. Um, unfortunately, they did confiscate it, because I wasn't allowed to have that much, um, like, foreign Green food leaves. into the <laughs> island, but it was it was really sad. But yeah, leaves are important. Yeah, the greens uh, are so important. Greens are important. Um, yes. Yes, so we have some food for thought, <laughs> some questions to ask y'all. Um, if you are in kindergarten, first or second grade, what montagnard fruit or food would you like to try? If you're in third, fourth, or fifth, um, did your family move to the city you're living in now from a different city, different state, different country, or do you have a friend who has moved? Um, sixth, seventh, and eighth grade, why do you think it's hard for Montagnards to sustain or maintain um, their traditional culture? And for high schoolers, um, what effects do you think war and migration or immigration 
had slash had have have had on families in Vietnam and in the United States. And you guys can type your answers into the chat if oh, you yes. want. Yes, type those in. answers. Yeah. <laughs> tick tick. Minutes. I don't know if you want me to pull it up and show some of the videos, or if you want to do Q and A, or a little bit of each. No, the videos were just like, yeah. the videos are really short. Yeah. They're thirty seconds to a minute long. Okay. Okay. Someone said war on families in the U.S. has been because so many people had lost their lives in the Vietnam War. So that was the effect of the Vietnam War on people in the United States. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's very true. Um, there was a lot of loss. Um, and so that loss in general is a very um, hurtful to families and can create a lot of um, separation. Yeah, separation. And it's also... Um, sad to think about the people because Montanar people specifically they fought alongside Americans so sometimes you have cases where those soldiers are not allowed back in the country because of this they're seen as traitors so it can be a dangerous situation when you're associated with that um, so there's also that some people can't go back to their homeland thank you for the answer by the way Okay, good. Oh, there's the wording that I'll pull up. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. So you guys can continue thinking about this. Um, you can also start typing questions that you have for these ladies into the chat. Mm -hmm. And while you do that, I'm going to try to pull up one other version of this presentation to see if we can get those videos working. Oh. So while we're looking at those questions, I'm going to play, since we can't play the videos, going to play a little bit of a the song for y'all in the background. Oh, okay. Um, now this is gonna be in Pleiku, and this is with the Jirai group of people. So we were with Abby's family, um, her mom's side of the family. And this was a special performance for us in the home we were at. <laughs> We're going to try to turn the screen and show it to Again, our handmade, made out of bamboo, uh, mostly. And the different lengths, they're at different lengths, the um, bamboo, and they are also cut to produce the pitch that they produce. Um, typically, it's repetitive, repetitive music, and you saw the soloist. Um, it's very upbeat, so it's made for dancing. I just want to show anyone around here that we can't take it short up. Okay. Yeah, we can do it. Okay, so this is one of our friend's grandmother, and she's singing. She's sharing with us one of the children's songs that we told you about with the animals eating the different fruits of the harvest. I'm trouble hearing us. Okay, I can speak a little bit louder. Okay, we'll speak up. Yung nando sa may titam, akalang kang tapang. 
<laughs> she was like, that's all grandma knows. <laughs> um, yeah, um, the older people are so gracious in sharing with us. And she was just, if you couldn't hear me earlier, she was singing about the different animals that were eating the different fruits of the harvest. And she said something about the squirrel this year are eating like the rice um, from the field. Yeah, so continuing with that theme of music, um, this is a group of Jirai girls who are going to be doing a dance that they choreographed. And they, I want to say they're like preteens to teenagers, uh, so pretty young. Um, they're pretty oh, I love that. Look at you. Yeah. Is it somebody's birthday? It's just because y'all are great, or did you win a popcorn party? Like I said, like I said, pretty repetitive. Um, a lot of emphasis on hand movements, um, foot movements down there, and pretty graceful as well. We're still having some issues hearing, so I don't know if it's if it's a connection issue, but okay. okay. So yeah, if you couldn't hear that, basically the movements, um, like I said earlier, are pretty repetitive. There's a lot of emphasis on hand and wrist movements and on ankle and feet movements. And you will notice like all the performers have been wearing their traditional outfits, so. We just have a couple more minutes, so if there's anything else you guys want to share or. Okay. Sure. No, this last one is a man weaving. This one. I think he's weaving. I think, oh, I basket. believe this is a basket. Yes, so this a is basket. a basket. So it requires a lot of handiwork, as y'all can see. And they, the, the bark that he's using is from like the forest, basically. And it's like a very, very special kind of bark where it's like malleable enough for him to bend, but like tough enough where it won't break. Um, and so it's really special. And then like after you harvest the bark or find the bark, you have to like strip it and like carefully strip the pieces into like uh, the same kind of sizes and shapes. Mm -hmm. And then you can actually start. So even like the process of organizing it is really difficult. And this is weaving the textile. So you can kind of see how she positions her body, what she exactly she has to do. do. Mm -hmm. So can we take questions while we play? Yeah, there actually there are no other questions. It's just other stuff that was within the chat that I okay. read immediately. Okay. So I'm more good. You guys can put it in a second. Okay. So thank you everyone for joining in. I hope you're able to hear some of this and, and learn about Montagnard culture. And we'll be back in about five minutes with our last presentation on New Year's in China and Peru. So thank you for joining us. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you.